My name is Jenny, Manager of Customer Success Operations at Ignite. I started in July of 2021, so still pretty new at the company, really enjoying my time there. And I have about eight years of experience managing operations and projects and driving business forward. I'm Brian O'Keefe. I'm the Digital Engagement Manager at Ignite, and I have been at Ignite since January, uh, hired during the pandemic. And I have eight years of experience strictly in customer success and over 20 years of, of experience in software. So exactly what is Ignite? So Ignite enables secure collaboration from any location. And we also provide visibility and governance over sensitive content, access identification and management of threats, like insider threats and ransomware, which is in the news a lot lately. Uh, and we also offer quick snapshot-based recovery in case you are attacked by ransomware. And we empower easy compliance with regulations like GDPR and HIPAA. Yeah, think of us as a really empowering company for your multi-cloud businesses using the collaboration tools that you are already familiar with. So Drive, Microsoft Office, I mean, who, who doesn't love a good PowerPoint, right? We all love Microsoft products. But one of the things that we struggle with today is the ransomware and GDPR and those compliance practices that are so important to keep your data safe and not at risk. So Ignite helps us do that. So now that you know a little bit about our business and what we do, you're probably a little curious about our team. Now I know the picture up there is a little small, but there are about six of us on our customer success operations team. And this is when we met in our Raleigh office and we we're just fighting the big fight for data collaboration and expanding our business operations. And we have about 33 customer success managers for both our mid-touch and high-touch sector. Yeah, we took that picture the very first time we met as a team in Raleigh. And I said, everybody, we're, we're in a big fight here. Let's show how we're going to handle that fight. Um, we have 21% of our customers assigned to a CSM right now. And 79% are assigned to the tech-touch sector. So now you know a little bit more about us, I'm going to go over our phased approach of how we kind of tackled our onboarding to Tango and Ignite. So I know this isn't super uh, full of information for what we'll cover, but we made it simple for you, an easy acronym of D-A-E. We had to discover to Tango on board for Ignite what did we have, what data was available, what playbooks was there, before we could go into our phase two approach of automate, which is what you guys are really all here for. But you have to do the groundwork, right? So you can't build a skyscraper, a 20-foot ceiling skyscraper, without digging first and laying the foundation before you can really grow, which leads to the third phased approach of evolution evolve. You've learned all throughout this conference that customer priorities change, business needs change, so it requires us to consistently pivot where needed, and that's where evolution will take place. But I think it's really important that you understand our story a little bit. So this is a small timeline of our story. So in July of 2021, I was onboarded uh, for op managing our operations for customer success. But just a few months later, or maybe just a few weeks, Brian, uh, we had a major restructure uh, within our organization and it left our operations team with myself and my director. And we didn't have anyone on the team with tribal knowledge of Tatango. So we've had Tatango since 2018. Amazing tool, incredible tool. But I'm gonna survey you all just for a little bit. How many of you in this room have ever taken on a tool all on your own? It was pre-built by a pre-administration, right? It's established, but there was no one for you to turn to to keep it going. Any of you taken on a tool, software, right? It is hard, isn't it? Come on, it's hard but it's well worth it. 
But that's what makes this stage that we're talking about today, discovery, so important. Building the groundwork in order to really create the automation practices that you need. So we had to discover what Totango was, what it could do, what was in the system, before we could ever start to automate. So Brian, why don't you tell them a little bit about automation? Yep. So I came on board and um, Tatango already had some campaigns built out, it had success plays built out, but they were only they were partially built out. So they were, I had to really look at it and figure out like what was there, first of all. What was it doing? How were we communicating? So my first big job was I went through everything that existed and reviewed it and started reworking it. I started identifying what needed to be reworked. Then I mapped out, we mapped out as a team the rest of the customer life cycle. What was missing? What did we have to add? What, what, were, what, what else were we going to do? Um, it was a lot of work. So we, we also had to discover all of our data sources. Where was all this data coming from? And we started, started talking to people in the organization. I said, oh, you know, I'm working you know, I'm, I'm with Tatango, and they would say, what's that? I'm like, how long have you been here? 10 years. They had no idea. So I discovered all these different groups and we all had different communication methods. We all had different tools we were using. Um, so we really had to figure out what we we're going to do to make this work. Mm -hmm. And then ending up in evolution, which is, as we all know, never ending. If you ever stop, I'd be a little scared for you. All right, so let's go into our first stage of discovery. So before automation, these are three things that we really focused on. We took the chance, well not chance, investment, investment of hiring a CS ops team to really manage everything. As you know, automation's great, but it needs to main be maintained. Your data needs to be maintained. You heard in some earlier sessions that exposing as much data as possible into Tango is incredibly important, but if you don't have an ops team to really manage it, are you really doing your customer success managers justice? Because you want to ensure that the data that you present to them is accurate, it's <laughs> uh, timely, and it's everything that they need to really perform their function. So as you bring more data into the platform, you need to have a team to support them right? Manage that data, manage that automation. So in October of last year, we hired two success analysts, and they are my rock. I depend on them so much, and I love them. They are amazing and have really taken our team and catalyzed us and helped us get to where we are today. But we didn't hire just success analysts. We hired a digital engagement manager, Brian, who's also incredible, to handle that digital engagement, that tech touch at all levels, low, medium, high touch kind of digital engagement and really running our digital engagement program. As you saw at the very beginning, 79% requires the tech touch. We're moving in that direction as an industry, right? We also hired a data engineer who works with our data lab data engineering, data analytics, and data science team to bridge the gap between CS and our data teams. I mean, you've heard it already millions of times today. Data, 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 it's so important. How are you gonna bridge that gap between your data team and your CS team? Our data engineer helps us do that, and he is smart as a whip. If you're watching this recording, you're amazing. <laughs> And then we have myself and then our director, and we are a team of six, and it's, we really catalyze CS, and we have so much more to go, it is not the end. Um, then what we did is we understood Tatango's de design. As you remember from what I said previously, we had no tribal knowledge. We had to dig first. What are our, our integrations? What data points were we bringing in? What did the prior administration build out of playbooks? You, you really have to know what is built prior before you start your automation processes and improving them, right? And then lastly, we established a Tango as a single source of truth for our customer success teams um, so that they can come in, as well as our sales teams, so they can come in too. They use Salesforce, but they can also use Tango specifically for usage data because um, we pull it into Tango. So from BigQuery to Zendesk, from 
a bunch of different data sources that I'm going blank on, uh, to Tango is the place that they can go to to find the information that they need. And we're constantly evolving and adding more to it so that we can continue to operate at a high scale. But here's my favorite quote, and this is why I'm driving that discovery phase into you. Bill Gates said, automation applied to an inefficient operation will only magnify the inefficiency. That is so true. That is so true. Not only will your internal teams feel it if you don't check out your data sources and don't really check out your automation before you go live. Hello, UAT testing. Your customer-facing people and your customers will also feel it. But we can't do this alone. We cannot do this alone. It requires collaboration across the org, which means you got to develop alliances. Yeah, so I just want to say our data analysts that we've hired are, are experts on data. So whenever I have a question about where, where data source comes from, I go to them and they're like, oh, it's da -da -da -da, and, then, and then here, and I'm like, 13 different sources and they know them all. So it's really incredible. Um, there were a couple things I had to, we had to do at Ignite as a team, uh, really to, to be successful. So we established alliances pretty quickly. And we really established pretty quickly that the, there were four key teams that we needed to ally with. Data team, marketing team, the product team, and the sales team. So we discovered each team kind of had a different method of communicating with customers, a different cadence, even um, kind of different branding of the Ignite brand. So we came together and um, we started working as a single team and introducing the concept of one voice of Ignite that's customer facing. So the product team and the CS team now work as one. That was really probably the hardest alliance to, to establish. The product team, um, we really got one of our team members to really be embedded with that team. Now he works with the product team every day. He knows exactly what they're doing. And he's established kind of a, cust a really strong customer facing element on the product team that really did not exist before. Like they'd say, well, it does this? Well, it's working fine. Like the customers are saying this. So he's providing that feedback. He even gets them to talk to customers sometimes. You know, they had regularly scheduled <laughs> um, times they talk to customers. People say, you know what? This customer would like to talk to you. And they're like, what? Oh, OK. He's like, I've got them on the phone right now. Let's get on. <laughs> um, so it's really established a customer-facing element on that team. And the sales team and marketing team were really, really critical. The marketing team um, was, was, has a lot of communications that we, we kind of discovered were duplicates. And it was kind of the same messaging. So we worked together to, as one team now when we're communicating. So all of their messages um, are going through our team as well. And then it's the sales team, who I think ended up loving uh, to tango more than anyone else. They all want licenses. They all <laughs> say, oh my god. Every day we're getting requests from the sales team for additional access. Um, really the most powerful collaboration of all. <laughs> so here's a couple tangible things that we actually did to, to form that alliance that I wanted to share. You know, as I said before, we established a single voice of customer communications with the customer. How did we do that? We established a customer communications calendar. If it is customer facing, it is now on that calendar. It has to be. We have a monthly review. So I actually had the review yesterday for October. And if it's customer facing, it needs to be on the calendar. The entire team needs to see it. The entire team needs to review it. We discovered there was an incredible amount of duplication and kind of confusing customer messaging. Um, really, really critical, we automated the workflow of NPS through Tatango. Um, we discovered that the responses were all based on who was looking at it and when. And there were multiple response mechanisms. So we now have a single response mechanism for all of our NPS feedback that is incredibly more efficient and clear to the customer who we are. Um, we established customer success representatives on each of those teams who are embedded in those teams. They are part of that team. They now see customer success as Michael, as Brian, as Jenny, not some adversary not some strange entity that's gonna make their lives harder. <laughs> um, and then most important of all is we established 
one single source of truth for all customer data. Before, you'd say, oh, go here, go here, go here. You want to know the ARR, you want to know the name of the contact, you want to know the um, anniversary date, three different databases. Everything's into Tango now. So if you have a question about customer data, it has made life so much easier um, for all of us. And there's clarity when we're communicating with customers as well. All right, so I know the discovery phase was a lot of content, but I promise you it's incredibly important to have before you start your automation processes. So one of the things we're going to cover at a high level is just multi-dimensional health, which we implemented earlier this year. It's really important for you to establish a health model or a health score, and that's exactly what we did. Multi-dimensional health was one of our very first elements that we tackled as a team after we've like, discovered all of our data points. Trust me, if you try to put your data in and you haven't validated it or checked it, your health model is not gonna showcase the accurate stuff, right? So we started building multidimensional health out basically last year with all of the discovery. It took those alliances with our data team, data science, data lab, data engineering, data analytics, can't you tell we love data? Gosh. <laughs> to build out multidimensional health for predictive elements, to be proactive and not reactive to understand health, right? So we used, obviously, Tango's best practices. I'm not gonna take credit for this particular image. This is Tango's image, but it was so pretty, right? <laughs> uh, for multidimensional health. So we started it last year. We had a project plan from January to May. It took six months, 50 to 60 different partners in order to establish it. And then in May, we launched it. So I know this is pretty simple. We have several different health models that are based on like, what the customer has purchased so we can look at them correctly. But we pull in data for both our direct and our indirect uh, customers. This even includes our MSPs so that our partner account managers can understand health as well. But in this model, we broke it down pretty simply. We, we do take 10% on survey scores, like your CSATs, your NPS, what are your customers saying? Uh, sentiment scores for our CSMs take out about 30%. Financial data, 10%, are they paying? Are they paying on time? And then about 50% is on product usage. We have two different parts on product usage. And uh, for product usage number one, when we launched in May, we made a major discovery. <laughs> Our product usage one had incredible numbers. Great adoption, super green, very healthy. But our product usage number two was struggling in the adoption phase. Now we had our growth numbers, we have Tableau, we're, we're seeing how our product usage number two was going, but multidimensional health helped us realize what they were struggling with when it came to adopting our product. And so, guess what? Like any good business model, we pivoted, right? We can't just keep doing the same thing that we're doing if our product usage number two wasn't doing as strongly as we hoped. And so from our executive team to our CSM team to our sales team, because they have visibility into these dimensions, we're able to understand what these conversations we can have with our customers, right? So CSMs, now that they can see everything that's happening on the dimensional level, they'll have a call with their customer and they'll be able to talk about their product usage at a much deeper level. How can we help you in this area? What, what may not be working in the product for this, right? Same with our sales team. It's just a better conversation with our customers. Now, I know you're probably thinking, like, okay, well, 79% of your like, customer base is tech, digital touch, right? What if there's not a, a sentiment score? Word of advice. Take that sentiment score and change it around to survey scores. Make that pie a little bit bigger because that's the voice of your tech customers, right? Your digital touch customers. For those that don't have a CSM assigned at the mid-touch or high-touch level, that pie for survey scores is a lot bigger because that's our way of measuring how they're feeling, right? 
But don't take your multidimensional health model, I mean, you learned this yesterday, um, and put it out once, and that's it, you're done. Okay, great, my multidimensional health model's built. I don't need to do anything else. Lies. Lies. <laughs> you have to iterate based on what your customer needs, what's happening in your business. It's, it's pretty consistent, right? But you have to continually build upon it, right? And let people throughout your org understand what health is, what's going on, in order to implement org-wide changes that are success-oriented. But multidimensional health didn't do just that. It helped us have data points for some of our campaigns. So Brian, I'd love for you to go into the onboarding and adoption campaign journey. Sure. So the very first thing we did is uh, we had an active onboarding campaign that had been established by the previous administration. We um, reworked it and we did really defined what are those key touch points when a customer needs to be reached out to and what do they need to know at that point. Um, what are the actions that are gonna drive the messages? What is the customer doing or what is the milestone that will drive that action? And then we really had to define like what are the lessons learned from all the existing campaigns? What don't we want to do? So we reworked all the campaigns and um, made them a lot simpler, that's for sure. Uh, so the existing campaigns were, we took them and trimmed them. We strengthened the calls to action in all the campaigns as well. So there's a very strong call to action. And then most importantly, we personalized all of those campaigns. So each message that goes out to a customer is written from the pro, um, perspective of a customer success manager to a specific customer. So there is a level of personalization in the automated messaging. And we also changed, we had an avatar that had signed them. Um, we sent the avatar to Fiji, who's fully retired, sitting there with a cocktail right now, and we now sign <laughs> with a real person. So every Tech Touch message is signed by me. So if they say, who's Brian O'Keefe? They can go find me on LinkedIn. There's all kinds of information. It adds a level of credibility to have a real person signing those messages. And they occasionally do reach out to me as well. So on occasion. I'm going to add on to that. We had um, a digital avatar, which is also very incredible. Uh, we had Sandra Taylor for several years. And once we we had a lot of feedback from customers of like, who's Sandra Taylor? I can't find Sandra Taylor on LinkedIn. I can't find them on your customer profile. I'm like, well, I'm not gonna say she doesn't e exist. So, <laughs> so Brian was able to sign it and we've seen larger engagement rates because they can look up Brian on LinkedIn. Oh, you work there. Great. It's less likely to be viewed as spam. It just reduces the possibility that that is how it's, tar it's labeled pretty quickly. And when I see fake names, when I see get messages, I'm like, delete immediately. I don't even look at it if it looks unreal. Um, so our onboarding campaign, we reworked the entire thing that was in existence. We shortened it. We made it much simpler. Um, we signed a real person. We strengthened the calls to action. And then we mapped out the rest of the customer journey. Um, so we're, we're going live with the adopt phase this month, and the, uh, we'll go with the renewal phase at the end of the year. And we've also reworked our advocacy campaigns as well. So we currently have a voice of the customer program, and we're going live with the new version next week. And big change is we are automating an advocacy ask for every net promoter who's also an administrator. So we did some testing, and it really worked out really well. Um, so we're implementing that. We promise we'll present the numbers in a minute. <laughs> so here's some responses from the automated campaigns, and it kind of amazed me. People look at it, and that warm, friendly feel, we get a warm and friendly response. So um, people have asked me, too, like, well, when you sign them, is, isn't it, are you being deceptive to your customers? Are you, you're not their customer success manager. No, I'm not. But I'm part of the customer success team. And my job is to connect you with the right resources when you need it. And that's exactly what I'm doing. So when they do check in with us, um, they end up getting connected with the right resource in the organization. And 
I don't think they care who's actually responding as long as someone is. <laughs> that is the key. So it kind of amazed me to see these messages as they come in. So I just put a few really great examples up here. So I want to talk about voice of the customer program. How many of you have implemented one? Don't you know I love surveying people? Thank God, that's a lot of people in the room. Wonderful. So we kind of automated our process, kind of. We automated the process for how we handle a particular NPS. It's a big one that we uh, look at at our own company. So beforehand, when we would get responses, they came through Slack, they came through email, and we did our best to follow up with them as we could. But one of the things that we needed to do was to ensure that the customer knew we were listening and they got a response back from us. And Tatango really did help drive this. So our NPS scores, when they come in, our comments with it, they go through a Tatango campaign and a very, very specific message is sent to each of our customers based on the comment that they left us and the score that they left us. And we have our detractors and our passives who have uh, campaigns where we call out their score and their comment. We did find that a lot of our customers would forget Oh, right, I did fill out a survey. What did I say? Um, but funny story, we had someone fill out, actually this happened several times, uh, for a detractor or passive. When we used dynamic data in the campaign, calling out the score and the comment that they left us, many of our detractors, or not many, some of them would give us a score or leave us a comment that would say, I don't know what you guys are, blah, 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 blah. maybe some colorful language. And when we would uh, reach out to them, like, why are you making me take this survey, blah, blah, blah. And when the campaign would come out, they realized that we were listening because we're calling out what they said in the campaign. <laughs> and they would, I mean, so fast, immediately reach back out to us. I am so terribly sorry. I did not mean to leave that comment. Please, let's talk. It would actually start a conversation. And it has really helped improve some of our relationship with our customers, driving engagement. It sounds a little scary. But it's not, because we're letting the customer know, we heard you, here's what you said, I want to hear more. And then we track it. So actually, we have some integrations into Tango to help us view some of that data, so like a Zendesk integration. We take those NPS responses, and when they respond to us, we route it through Zendesk so that we can see it in a queue, so we can route it to the right personnel. Right? Is this billing? Is this, does this need a CSM? Does this require a support personnel? Should this be pushed to product? And as soon as it's in that queue, we're able to measure or how long did it take to reach out? Who does it go to? Did we officially close the loop with this customer? Because it's sometimes really hard to track that closing the loop process. We close it. And if an executive wants to know, hey, I read this comment, I want to know what happened. Okay, yeah, this is the campaign that we sent out. Here's how we followed up. Oh, it was a product enhancement request. Here it is, because I could find it really easily. And doing so actually caused us to reduce our workload reduction by 50% for managing our uh, voice of the customer program. I mean, I used to spend with our team hours making sure we followed up with NPS. Now it's more streamlined, and it's a lot easier. The other data point I want to point out was in our discovery phase, when we were able to dive into every single attribute, knowing our integrations, knowing the system, we were able to pull out 60% of deprecated or duplicated data. Our CSM, sales, everyone who's in it can now really, really trust and depend on the data in Tatango because we took the time to go through everything that was in there before we started doing automation work. It took a year, a year, so don't think it's easy. Right? Anything that's done well will be difficult. Uh, Brian, I'd we, love to hear more also, about campaigns. Yeah, we also had a 30% response rate from our initial test for the automated advocacy ask, and we enrolled 75% of those responses into our advocacy program, which was amazing. So it's now become an advocacy feeder. But most impressive is we reduced messaging to customers by collaborating internally, by working together, by reviewing everything that exists to all forms of messaging, by 75%. Our customers are getting one quarter the number of messages from us, which is absolutely Yes. <laughs> so what's next you know, in the evolution phase? So we 
we have a, a long road ahead of us, and we know we're at the very, we're still at the very beginning. So what we're, we've done in our programs is established a review process. So every piece of our automated campaigns will be reviewed on a regular basis, and we will adjust what's working and what's not. In fact, our first review will be coming up for the, we went live in June, so in October, we're gonna start reviewing that campaign. And we're gonna really look at the data. What's the data telling us? That's probably the most important element. Listen and engage and inc uh, include our partners in all of the feedback because we know the, the teams that are customer facing know exactly how the customers are reacting to all of the messaging and to all of the actions we're asking for. So we, we're really working that feedback in very, very carefully to all of our programs as we adjust. And we're always prepared to pivot because we know that tomorrow there'll be a new business directive. It's almost inevitable. Tomorrow there will be, there'll be a new manager coming on board. There'll be something, there's change is inevitable. So don't get too comfortable. Be prepared to, to move as you need to. But the most important thing I really want to recommend to everybody is don't be afraid to experiment. And discover just by experimenting a little bit, we kind of did run little pilot programs just with a few customers at a time and discovered really what works and what doesn't. And it's really made our program so much stronger and so much better. A lot of the things we've done, like, like Brian, you can't sign your name. Customers will be calling you all the time. I'm like, actually, if they do that, that's actually a good thing. We actually want that because something's seriously wrong if they're calling me all the time and we want to identify what is wrong in the organization. Um, so be bold, experiment, see what works, and see what doesn't. I'm gonna make a little note on that. So, you know, Tatango releases a lot of different betas. Well, I know that we love to participate in some of the betas, and it can be scary to participate in one. Participate, you could really change how it works and help evolve customer success by participating in them. Well. <laughs> Thank you.